As climate change brings about a rise in temperatures across the globe, our cities are facing an existential problem, extreme heat. Forecasters predict temperatures could reach around 37 degrees centigrade this week. Philadelphia issued a health emergency advising people to limit their time outdoors. We're looking at 150 million people under heat alerts. So what can be done to battle urban heat waves and cool down our cities? As more and more people have flocked to cities in recent decades, the temperatures in these cities have gone up. This is caused by something called the urban heat island effect. The urban heat island effect is essentially this phenomenon that explains why temperatures are much hotter in urban cities than rural or suburban areas for as close as three miles away. This is due to a few different things. Tall buildings trap and cause hot air to stagnate. Heavy road traffic and industry emit heat. And finally, cities have dark pavements or black asphalt or roads that typically absorbs heat from the sun. So when you're walking in the street, you can feel trapped heat sort of radiating. And even at night, when temperatures are supposed to cool down, the rest of the heat still gets released back into the urban space. This can have devastating effects on the population of cities. Some of the most common ones we see are power outages because the power grid is typically just so overwhelmed with demand for air conditioning. Which are energy intensive, bad for the environment, and tend to make the outside space hotter by expelling heat out onto the streets. And then it also overwhelms health services due to heat-related health conditions. And it also decreases worker productivity, especially for outdoor workers, typically construction workers, because they've been outside for too long that it often becomes unbearable. And in overcrowded cities like New York or Los Angeles, we also see violence rising or, you know, we tend to get so frustrated when it's so hot and psychologically and emotionally, the anger just grows and that eventually also leads to intimate partner violence, which starts to spike during extreme heat waves. And while it's true that entire cities are getting hotter, urban heating also exposes grave inequalities within these cities. For example, green spaces, like parks, are highly effective at cooling an area down. But in the U.S., green space and other cooling measures are not equally available to everyone. When you think about who has access to green spaces or can afford soaring high electricity bills for air conditioning units, you know, those are typically wealthy white people versus people who are going out to cooling centers, lining up for food or drinking water, playing with fire hydrants to keep themselves cool. These inequalities aren't a coincidence. When you go back to the racist city planning policies that were imposed during the segregation area, like redlining, where housing loans and insurance were denied for people of color, that trickles down to the historical legacy of injustice that we see now that relates back to extreme heat. In fact, a recent study has shown that formerly redlined neighborhoods in the U.S. are a good indicator of which communities will suffer from extreme heat today. Perhaps nowhere is this seen more clearly than in New York City, where the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, or NIJA, is on the front lines of the battle over extreme heat. So the city's just really, really hot. Specifically, though, in New York City, extreme heat isn't distributed equally. One of the ways we see this is from the New York City Heat Vulnerability Index. Which is really just a metric that identifies neighborhoods with a higher risk for heat mortality or heat-related deaths. And so 12 of the communities that are ranked the highest on this scale are predominantly composed of low-income residents of color. And so as summer in New York gets hotter, Jalisa and the folks at Nija are working within these communities to prepare them for a future of extreme heat. So through research and advocacy, we really want to make sure that people are prepared for extreme heat. This preparedness approach can take on many forms, such as early warning systems, buddy schemes to check on the most vulnerable people, like elderly people living alone or people with disabilities, as well as directing community members to cooling centers. Because while air conditioning can be vital in protecting people against extreme heat, rising private use of energy intensive air conditioning will actually add to the climate crisis. Not to mention, there's financial barriers to having ACs um, in your home, especially with electricity costs. And so cooling centers have become really important for extreme heat issues. The idea is to provide a space that people can go to 
when there's a heat wave to cool off. But Nija understands that in order to fight urban heat, they have to work hand in hand with folks in the community. Not all environmental justice issues will look the same in each community. So through research and advocacy, we really want to make sure that people are prepared for extreme heat. And so kind of the way Nija works is that anything that we do, it's going to be with our members in those environmental justice communities. People's lives are at stake. I mean, if temperatures are getting hotter and hotter each year, you know how serious it's going to get. There's no one fix solution. So when it comes to, you know, passing climate adaptation and resiliency plans or an, any heat action plan, we really need to think about how do we put equity and justice front and center of these adaptation plans because they are on the front lines of the climate crisis, they are on the front lines of extreme heat.